Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the faculty who will be discussing access. Uh, I'm Dr. Jean Joseph, a chair of, of urology at UC of Rochester Medical Center in Rochester, New York. I'm pleased to be joined today by, with, by Dr. Alvin Goff, uh, associate attending at Memorial Stone Kettering Cancer Center, director of robotic urologic surgery and technology education, and Dr. Kowalczyk, Associate Professor, Director of Radio Oncology at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital, and Dr. Kevin Zorn, Associate Professor of Urology, Director of Robotic Surgery at University of Montreal Hospital Center. Uh, the agenda today, we will be uh, first, Dr. Go will speak uh, about a simplified access and how to set up for transperitoneal robotic prostatectomy. I will follow with the discussion of the extra peritoneal access using multi-port and single port. And Dr. Zorn will share with us access uh, tips and tricks in complex patients. We'll conclude, we'll conclude with Dr. Kowalczyk, who will uh, discuss how to avoid complications and how he does it. I will turn over now to Dr. Uh, Go. Okay. Thank you, John, for that introduction. So good morning, everyone, and thank you to the organizing committee for the opportunity to speak today. I'm going to be talking about transperitoneal robotic prostatectomy and how to, to set up uh, the basic steps for access, port placement, and bladder mobilization. Here are the topics I'll discuss. I'll have a quick refresher on the main types of robotic systems that are out uh, in use this, these days. We'll talk, talk about the principles of setup a bit about optimizing patient positioning, and we'll go through the pointers about the bladder mobilization and exposure. So as many of you know, there are two main systems that are currently in use, the SI and the XI. The SI robot is a cart-based system uh, that works mainly on itself in a triangulated format, and the XI is a boom-based system which allows the base to be placed anywhere around the patient, and the arms work mainly in a straight line. Here are some of the supplies we use for positioning we use a blue foam pad uh, to prevent sliding during steep Trendelenburg. The jellies uh, are for padding the elbows and securing the arms, and then a foam chest strap. This is the way we secure the arm. This is the under over arm tucking technique. We use a draw sheet, to pull that over the under the arm and then over, and then tuck that behind the patient. And this is the final look uh, before we secure with the chest strap. So this is the supine uh, position and secure securing configuration for most pelvic surgery. It's arms tucked, elbows padded, and a chest strap to secure on a foam pad. This is really useful. It's a versatile technique for prostatectomy, cystectomy, and reimplant surgery, and even bilateral RPLND. Of course, we're gonna use Trendelenburg for most of this case, and we're usually around 28 degrees. If you have a, 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 um, a, a bed with table motion, you can, you can lock this in uh, for your anesthesiologist to position. So next, I'm going to start with a video uh, that will really just display a very simplified technique for access. I think this is, makes it very reliable and easy to place, uh, to get access, and then also place the ports. So we'll start with that supine positioning I just mentioned. We'll make a 12 millimeter incision just above the umbilicus, and this is where our air sill port will be placed. This is probably a little bit different from most folks who are using an XI for their port configuration, and I actually, in that I actually place the assistant port here in the center, and I do this for a few reasons. First off, this uh, was adapted from when we used to perform access uh, in the SI, and we had a 12 millimeter camera port here. But uh, now I put the assist port here, and what that does is it places the assistant in the center. This is the main port through which they'll have access, and so they have unobstructed access to both sides of the pelvis, which facilitates placement of clips, and assisting. So we'll dissect down to the fascia, grasp this with a coker, and then place a varus needle. We use a drop test to confirm our placement, and then we'll begin the insufflation. So instead of incising the fascia like a sign, we varus here, and so that'll prevent any leakage. So while we're insufflating, we'll go ahead and mark out our port placement. So we draw a straight line underneath the umbilicus, we have two eight millimeter ports on the left-hand side with a five millimeter port laterally for assisting, and then two eight millimeter ports will be placed on the right-hand side. Once insufflated, we'll then place the 12 millimeter air seal port. 
and then we'll place our camera and the rest of the ports will be placed under direct vision. So this first port that we'll place is the five millimeter assist. And I like to place the ports from a lateral to medial progression because this allows direct vision of each port as it passes. So this next port is the eight millimeter left hand working arm port. And this port just off the midline to the left will be our future camera port. You'll see in subsequent videos that even though it's off midline, there's not much difference in the perspective. And then we'll switch now to the right hand side of the abdomen and we'll go ahead and place our additional eight millimeter ports. The lateral port will be our fourth arm port. And then the medial one will be the working right hand port. And again, we're gonna place these under direct vision. I like to use the sharp throw cars. I feel like there's less pressure that you have to place when you do that. The air seal tends to give a little bit more than standard insufflation, so prefer this to the blunt. Now, once our ports are positioned, we'll go ahead and dock the robot. In this case, the base is coming from the left, and then that'll be our camera port site. So then for the next video, I'll go ahead and talk about the basics for bladder mobilization and exposure to set up the prostatectomy. So again, this is a transperitoneal approach. This is a standard patient, really without much adhesions, but we usually start by mobilizing the sigmoid in the left pelvis. We'll identify the medial umbilical ligaments and then divide the uracus. We're dissecting along the sides of the umbilical ligaments and then mobilizing anteriorly, separating the bladder from the anterior abdominal wall. Fourth arm is used for retraction. And this is the, the border for our lateral dissection down to where the vas crosses underneath the medial umbilical ligaments. It's important here as we dissect the lateral corners to really dissect away the tissue and mobilize the bladder uh, off the endopelvic fascia and then uh, deep down to the obturator space. So the superficial dorsal vein is usually cauterized here and then we'll defat the prostate. So in this next case, I'll show you, it's a patient who's had bilateral inguinal hernia pairs with mesh. And so this presents a slightly different challenge in mobilizing the bladder. It's quite variable what that can look like. So on the right-hand side, you can see the mesh starting to come into view. It's adherent to the paravesical fat, but fairly easy to separate. On the left, there's a bit more mesh present and it's actually adherent to the bladder wall. So most of this dissection can be done with electrocautery. There's some areas where it's pretty, uh, pretty stuck. So I'll do this dissection sharply. And then we'll proceed with a little bit more cautery to clear off the, the bladder off the mesh here. Once that's done, we can proceed with the rest of the procedure. So a few take home messages, as with all surgery setup is really key to success here. Proper patient positioning can really facilitate access and help minimize complications. I think this simplified port configuration enables reproducibility and really optimizes access for the bedside assistant. And in my opinion, a transperitoneal approach, it's familiar, it's easy to learn, and it allows broad exposure for high risk disease as well as an extended lymph node dissection. Thank you very much. So now I'll turn this back over to Dr. Joseph and we'll continue with his portion of the, of the presentation. Well, thank you, uh, Alvin. That was very, very nicely done. Sharing the, some tips and tricks uh, to approach uh, the extra in your space. Uh, this this uh, instrument is key. It's really the balloon that has been used for hernia repair. I've been using it for over a decade to create the space. And what you do, you create the space under direct vision with a camera inside. Usually I use a standard uh, camera as opposed to the Da Vinci camera to develop the space initially and subsequently show, place the robotic camera in. I'll share that with you shortly. Uh, this instrument is also key in terms of creating the space laterally. The challenge with multi-port extra peritoneal surgery is that you cannot get laterally enough to place the assistant ports. That can be a challenge. Uh, this video here, accessing on the left parambilical area and uh, exposing the interior sheath, pulling the muscle laterally. I'm standing on the left side of the patient, pulling the muscle laterally. And uh, effectively, the balloon dilator, the camera is placed inside, you can see the space under direct vision. Here, the right epigastric vessels are visualized. And this is the uh, peritoneal lining. This is the left side. 
and the pubic symphysis is right here in the midline. At the end, of the, at the end a S retractor is used and we pull the dilator out. You can see the posterior extra sheath. This trocar is then used to help create additional space laterally. So insufflation is started. Uh, not enough space right now laterally, so the smooth trocar is used to create the space by going next to the muscle and pushing the peritoneum cephalad to allow you to place the assistant trocars. And here on the left side, just beneath the epigastric vessels, the left assistant ports are being, left robotic ports are being placed. And once uh, that is done, uh, you can see I, I normally use a, a needle to help stay away from the epigastric vessel to chart the course of the trocar to avoid any epigastric injuries. And it's a very safe, uh, reliable way of getting access. And this is a six port configuration. At the end of this, I have to exchange this trocar for a 12 millimeter stapler trocar. That's the issue with the XI. Um, this is exchanging to the eight uh, to allow you to get the camera, the proper camera in place. And quickly, as you dock, uh, you can see this patient had a hernia uh, repair. And here I was dissecting laterally to allow the assistant from the right side to come over this mesh because it was kind of ma making it hard. Despite a, peritone a peritoneotomy, uh, the procedure was, was uh, uneventful. You can access the pelvis without difficulty. Uh, the advantage of this approach is there is no bladder takedown. Immediately, you get to the, the fascia. You can open it on either side and care the procedure. So some time savings there. I'll share more on that uh, in a little bit. This is what the typical uh, look when you have the insufflation in the extra pitonal space as opposed to the abdominal cavity. Um, if you have the abdominal cavity uh, insufflated, something that have significant bellowing, making it difficult to work in the extra pitonal space. And this is a typical arrangement uh, of a six port trocar on the left side, so you can see the inside view and the outside view before exchanging it for the XI. If you have an XI robot, we have to exchange the, the, the trocar. The, this approach is ideal for large patients and patients who've had prior abdominal surgery. This gentleman had a, a, a hand assisted nephrectomy sometime in the past, and this was the uh, view after the, after the operation. For large prostate, it's certainly very accessible, very doable. And this is an extreme patient who had a liver transplant. Uh, you can see the Chevron incision also had a kidney transplant. Uh, we did uh, we protected the allograft by going slightly shifting it to the left. You can see the kidney over here. And in the end, that's really the setup that we had. We used three, three ports as opposed to a four-arm robot. So this is a very efficient approach. The cavity, the abdomen is avoided with potential benefits. And you eliminate adhesions that may be there. You also eliminate creating adhesions that uh, could be formed with the access. You maintain the less invasive goal. And I've been saying for some decade now, there'll be greater adoption with the single port because there's no lateral dissection. I will share with you a brief uh, video of the single port, uh, how we create this space. This over here, you can see on the right side, the epigastric. This is the peritoneum coming down. Here, the left epigastric, peritoneum coming down. That's all you need to do. There is no need for lateral space creation because you don't need to be that lateral. In this particular patient, I was using an SP plus one. So using a needle, I'm tracking which way I want to put my uh, extra port. So for the plus one, I went right into the bag while the bag is insufflated. That's been uh, very helpful because you can avoid any peritoneotomy and you pull the bag out and on the you inspect it afterwards to ensure the entire bag came out. And you can see the 12 port that I placed here for this plus one. And this is the docking of the single port and ultimately you get all your instruments in place with the plus one to help you pass uh, needles and, or larger needles, what have you. Normally I use a pure SP technique, but if you have to use an SP plus one in the early phase of your learning curve, um, that's a way of uh, accessing uh, the extra particular space to carry the procedure with no bladder takedown necessary. At the end of the procedure, I place the drain in the same port and you want to inspect it to make sure that there is no bleeding, uh, clearly, which could be an issue if you close the epigastric vessel, which I'm sure my colleagues will discuss uh, further uh, as we go through this presentation. 
Thank you. I will pass my pass on now to Dr. Kevin Zon from the University of Montreal. Thank you, Jean. I'm um, Jean. Thank you to my fellow colleagues and to the invitation committee for uh, the opportunity to present this morning. And I was deeded the task to present on setup uh, access uh, situations where uh, tricks and tri tips may give us a, a better uh, approach into our surgical uh, field. Uh, introduction, uh, the uh, standard port placement I'll review and our experience, um, some of the variations of anatomies, particularly in the obese, the thin patients, some patients who have very scaphoid abdomens, those with previous surgeries, and some tricks and trades to uh, uh, further advance uh, patient outcomes. So I think everyone's very attuned to the positioning, which is really the key setup for having good surgery. This starts from the patient positioning and the angle. Uh, Dr. Go presented on the use of, uh, we have a special device in ROR measuring the exact angle. So I see some smiles. We all have our set points. Ours is 20, so we aim for 20 degrees. I think Guy goes more, uh, but ultimately that's just sort of part of the algorithmic process. Uh, we use the Allen Hugavac, so uh, we've had good success with that, and I've had the opportunity myself to go sit in it, and it's pretty impressive how you really are secure, and there's no collision. If you have some of the arms that compress against the arm or the hand during procedure, this really does a nice way of quickly using aspiration to fit the form of the patient and be deflated. So uh, nice investment if you haven't looked into it. Uh, I don't know what generation they're on, but this is the one that we use uh, for our cases. Uh, port position, again, I think everyone has their own style and differentiation based on the handedness, a right hand or a left handed assistant, um, the positioning and the placement of clips. So we pu previously published on our um, setup using the SI and now the X uh, systems, slight variations. And one of the benefits we've seen with the SI and the X is that longer excursion, which some of the, uh, those using former systems, we had less reach. Uh, so we had to move the trocars down. So I think the standardization of trocar position is really key. Uh, try to avoid any trocars seven centimeters apart. I think that's going to help in any external or internal collisions. Um, I usually like to start with a varus needle. Dr. Gold did nicely a, a demonstration that. I usually insufflate to 20 millimeters of mercury, giving some of the pressure on the abdomen so that you can place in your trocars easily. Back in the day, we used to transluminate, and especially in the obese patients, I'm sure everyone on this phone call and on this, uh, in the Zoom and this meeting have all had patients who've had good outcomes. We did great surgery, but in post, they show these pictures postoperatively, they have some hematomas, to which we know they won't be transfused, but it's an unsightly thing and causes some distress. So I kind of got fed up of getting a, a pile of emails. And so uh, I looked out and we've introduced this as part of our little step process. It's an AccuVein system. Uh, it helps find veins in uh, children or certain people have difficult vein access. And we use it prior to marking and doing the incisions to identify in certain cases like this, particularly in the lateral borders above the ASIS, we come across lovely little veins, which cautery will certainly work. And we don't pick up as well on transillumination, but the assistant uh, at bedside where the nurses just shines that on. And we may move the trocars uh, up or down a couple of millimeters. So everyone on here on this phone call, and I'm sure in, in the audience, at some point has made an incision and starts bleeding and they're cauterizing, they're making the incision bigger. Uh, so this is a simple little trick to, especially at the beginning of the case, you don't want to be stunted by dealing with some nuisance bleeding or post-operatively. And we've seen in our series, you know, uh, looking at those lateral ports, the above the SAS, the movement of the trocar was around 40%. And by doing this, we're able to reduce abdominal wound hematomas from around 8% to, uh, to significantly lower numbers. So simple little trick, it's a single cost and it's something that we've introduced. Um, other features, again, I think we've talked about the air seal and some of the advantages looking a little scientifically. Um, during laparoscopic surgery, who cares if you lose abdomen, if your suction gets stuck, you lose pressure, well, the trocar is married to the skin. In the robotic surgery, the trocar is married to the robot and it sits fixated in three-dimensional space. So if the abdomen drops, you lose trocar access and uh, no one likes that, get, having to deal with a, a trocar out of position. You get sub-Q emphysema and you have to struggle getting the trocar back in. So we used to use the insuflow and you can see here the good old suction being held on the left quickly the abdomen drops. And with the air seal, uh, we will to have that constant flow. So if I'm a pilot, if I set my altitude at 31,000 feet, I'm flying at 31 no matter what, no matter who my assistant is that day. So I think that's one of the advantages of being able to operate, not just at a regular 1450 millimeters of mercury, we're able to do lower pressure. So I'm not sure in the audience and on my faculty, the ability now to operate at eight to 10 millimeters of mercury is the new standard for me. And this stems from some of the work from the general surgery teams where they're doing laparoscopic cholecystectomy with low pressures. And you can see here uh, the studies showing pain at 6, 12, and 24 hours being significantly reduced. So this idea of low impact surgery uh, falls out and makes sense for uh, same-day surgeries. And uh, Dr. Abaza 
has done some great work showing his ability to do even outpatient surgery and the use of uh, doing surgery at six millimeters of mercury. So you can see here the comparison and then the main pain score uh, postoperatively being of significance. So I think that's a huge feature and I think most people are probably using this these days. But again, starting pressure for me, we're starting to 20, having a nice taut abdomen, getting those trocars in nice and easy. And then during the surgery, dropping down to eight. Um, now moving into instrument collision, I think that's always a pain in the butt. And I think that's something that we can work on either internal, and that has to do, I think, with the trocar uh, positioning and its access, uh, knowledge of the assistant trocar uh, location of instruments. And if there's ever a concern, back up, look where the uh, collision is, and then uh, work accordingly. If need be, take out the instrument, stand from the robot, go look and see what's going on. You don't want a bowel injury. Looking at external collisions, again, that's sometimes, I think, the fourth arm. Uh, that has to do with how close or far away the robot is. Uh, distancing the arms away, sometimes it's the legs. You can lower down the stirrups and move them more medially, getting that out of the way for that there's not that external collision. And then the master, I think, learning to do the clutch, and that's sometimes some of our residents issue. They're operating with their hands up in the air. We have to teach them about the clutch button to move the arms down. Trocar placement, also key aside from the venous access, I think we have to realize and be uh, cognizant of previous abdominal surgeries, moving, array, moving uh, trocars uh, away from previous surgical sites, and our entry point should also be cognizant of, of those as well. Uh, knowledge of the vascular anatomy, so I think the epigastric is someone that uh, can cause some trouble, and ever, ever, whoever does lots of robotic surgery at some point may have an uh, epi, uh, epigastric artery injury, and those can be uh, uh, not fun for need of transfusions, what have you. So, being aware of that anatomy and taking uh, the necessary steps to avert, avoid those areas. Particularly of previous uh, incisions where uh, those of uh, intestine, uh, we don't know as we, we all have that experience. Uh, once you insufflate the abdomen and you move it with your camera, that's your first time despite any kind of CT MRI, you don't know what's affixated to the abdominal wall. And for that reason, putting your first choker away from that site. So if you standardly put it around the umbilicus and someone had umbilical hernia, put your choker elsewhere. As Ralph Clayman told me, fives are free. You can put in another five or 10 millimeter choker. The patient will still go home the next day. You just don't want to have any access injuries. Um, and if there is lots of adhesions, using your laparoscopic skills and taking down those adhesions. Um, we don't want to see any of these through and through bowel injuries. And obviously, if those do occur, consult general surgery and deal with those. So again, here's a case where you presented to me, a patient had previous abdominal surgery, appendectomy, uh, and so obviously our trocars took in, into consideration uh, those, uh, those, those previous surgeries. Patients with obesity, I think we have to keep in mind that what we see on the skin is not what's really inside the abdomen, especially in the standing panis position. So these are patients where uh, we have to keep in mind that the umbilicus will not be a good reference point to these patients. So uh, we may want to be moving our trocars more cephalad, in, uh, especially in the Trendelenburg position, to allow us better access to uh, the deeper structures and to work against the unfixable uh, pubic bone angle. So uh, we've all had issues where we're fighting the pubic bone and we're all rubbing the bone or we can't get access. So little tricks of the trade aside from moving our chokers up is to clutch down, push the skin, use that laxity, move it north and giving us a few extra centimeters to get a better angle into the pelvic uh, structures. So I think that's the key is that, you know, knowing your differences between the uh, XI and the uh, SI systems, uh, or if you're using single port, you don't need to worry about that all together. Um, and again, the other one that I thought was unique that I sometimes struggle with too are those really thin patients, the 130 pound guys coming in for their prostates and you have very little space, you try all your best. And I think one of the key things there is using that clutching ability, um, which I'll show you momentarily. So some of the ideas, the epigastric vessels, and here's the idea of that using that skin laxity, uh, getting your assistant to pull the trocar clutch and either pushing down, pushing north and getting that uh, access to a better angle to uh, avoid any structures. So in summary, I think the trocar is having a standardized approach, being aware of all uh, anatomy and collisions and other vasculatures. I found the AccuVein something really simple. It uh, seems to really make a difference with uh, those unsightly wound hematomas. And then use of air seal to have that reliable, consistent pressure, and as well, the ability to do low impact surgery. So I really think that makes a difference in patient outcome for pain control. So with that, I turn the, the baton back to Dr. Germain, uh, to, to Jean-Joseph for uh, a reassessment for the final discussion. Thank you, Dr. Kowalczyk. You, Dr. Joseph, the planning committee, uh, Dr. Zorn, and Dr. Go, all tough acts to follow. It's, it's my job to talk about uh, avoiding complications and what to do if you have those complications. Um, uh, and I guess fortunately for me, uh, I, I don't really have much video in this, um, uh, and fortunately for my patients, but unfortunately for you. But we'll go over the basics of how to avoid complications um, and also 
how to uh, deal with them when you do have them. So uh, my colleagues did a great job of setting things up. We do a lot of these things the same. Um, and when you're placing these trocars and something goes wrong, it can be very, very serious. And actually 50% of laparoscopic surgery complications occur during the access itself. So, you know, we might do all of this fast and, and you know, we have our own ways of doing it very quickly, but we have to realize that just this setup is the most important part and that 50% of the time, that might be where we have a significant complication. Thankfully, it's uncommon, um, but the leading cause of mortality after laparoscopic surgery is because of a vascular bowel injury uh, during access. And this also leads to 15% of open conversions. Um, so as a great man, Ian Kill once said, uh, if you plan ahead, then when things happen, you're prepared for them. Planning is the best prevention. I think my colleagues beforehand have set up their ways of planning and being ready for things. So you need to be ready for when these things happen and know what to do. And that's what this talk is about. Very easy things that we might take for granted uh, is make sure you, we very rarely use an NG tube, but the OG, OG tube is placed specifically for, uh, I would say, left-sided kidney surgery. That's especially important um, to avoid any uh, access-related injuries to the bowel. Fully catheter, we know this because we're urologists, but our, our other colleagues may not, to avoid injury to the bladder. And if you're doing a pelvic surgery uh, where the patient's in supine, keep the patient flat. I don't know of anyone that puts them in Trendelenburg first and then puts their ports in, but if you do this, don't, because that's going to bring your great vessels closer to the abdominal wall with a much higher increase uh, of risk of, of vascular damage. Uh, for the varus needle, which I and obviously my colleagues do, uh, I use it ex exclusively. Uh, I do like to use towel clamps to lift the abdominal wall up. I know not everybody does this, and it's not a definite thing if it helps or not. Certainly doesn't help with our high BMI patients, but for our normal size patients, uh, I do like to lift that, uh, the skin up off the, uh, and lift the abdominal wall up, and I place the varus needle directly. Um, so like I said, I use the varus needle. I don't make a prior incision. I lift up with the, the towel clamps, and I will try to always place it at my anticipated camera port. Uh, as long as there are no previous incisions or scars. And, and like Dr. Zorn said, if that happens, then I'll have to readjust and get my access laterally or somewhere else. Uh, it's recommended that you place the varus needle at a 45 degree angle. Uh, in reality, I, I like to, I, I actually do put it at, at a right angle because I feel, I, I can feel the fascial layers much, much better. Although theoretically this is a risk because you are going straight into the abdomen uh, and potentially may have a high risk, but I have not had a problem. Um, once I'm in, I just go right to the insufflation on high flow. Uh, you know, the varus needle is only, only has a, it restricts the flow anyway, so there's no reason for, in my opinion, to just do low flow to high flow. Um, and the drop test and the, uh, and, the, and the aspiration test, I've stopped doing that. I read a paper that the sensitivity is only 40%, and I've had plenty of times where I've done the drop test and it works, I'm in the wrong place. Um, so I just do the opening pressure, which is the most important indication of proper placement. Should be less than 10 millimeters. I think we, it really, in reality, should be less than five millimeters uh, of mercury when, during your open pressure. If you need to, people talk about the Palmer's point. Um, if you're not having good luck, uh, which is in left upper quadrant, you can also do it in the right upper quadrant, uh, modified midclavicular line, three centimeters below cost of margin, as this is going to be an area with a lower risk of injury to any bowel uh, or vascular structures. It'll obviously you then increase your risk of the splenic injury on the left side, hepatic injury on the right side. I will then place my, uh, my port. The, now I have the XI, or if, I'm, um, if I didn't, I was using a 12 millimeter port. I place it directly uh, after I have 15 millimeters of mercury. Uh, and if I keep that insufflation valve open, so then I go very, very slowly, feel those fascial layers, and once I hear that, that air, I know I'm in the right place. Uh, after initial port placement, like my colleague said, direct visualization is the key. Um, Transillumination, as Dr. Zorn alluded to, uh, is helpful to avoid those, uh, those very, very cumbersome uh, bruises, which unfortunately I have seen. Um, but it doesn't always work, so I, I do think the view device is very, very interesting because you know transillumination is not going to show you the epigastrics either. So these are, uh, but and it's not going to work for your high BMI patients. So it's something to do, but I don't always do it. Um, don't short on the skin incision. I think our, our residents and some other people are really, you know, they try to make the smallest incision, but just one millimeter can make a huge difference. Uh, if you're if you're short the skin incision, you're pushing very, very, very hard, and then the next thing you know. Um, the, 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 the port goes through very, very quickly. If you're having trouble, just, just extend the skin inc incision. Um, I, I do not like to use the sharp tip, tip trocars. Uh, it's just how I was trained. I use the reusable blunt tip trocar seen on the right side. Um, I don't find it to be any more difficult. Uh, again, I think there's, there is less of a risk, in my opinion, of if, if that trocar goes into bow or into a vessel, that that's going to penetrate that vessel. But also bladed trocars can increase your risk of hernia in the future. Um, and then once all of your ports are there, very, very important, make sure your assistant ports and your robotic ports are clear of any adhesions or obstructions because you're going to be placing in and out different robotic instruments. Your assistants are going to be putting in sutures and you don't want to have an un unseen bowel injury because they're placing something blindly. So I always make sure that the path is clear. So we'll first start with vascular injuries. Again, very low incidence, but it's probably underreported. Usually it's an abdominal wall injury as we referred to before. If it's significant and getting in your way, uh, there are three main ways that you can take care of this. And the first two are tamponading. First is very basic. You can just lift up your trocar uh, and tampon on for a few minutes. If that doesn't work, you can place a Foley catheter. 
push up the, 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 the balloon and pull it again for a couple of minutes. And finally, the last resort is you can use a Carter Thompson to place a U-stitch. Hopefully that takes care of things and then you can place a trocar somewhere else laterally. Uh, intra-abdominal vascular injury, injury is obviously a nightmare. Uh, I, I know, you know, I've seen Ronnie Baza have a video where he's repaired the aorta for this. For me, this, unless I can see the injury right away and I'm set up for it, this is an immediate open conversion uh, and communication is the key. Everyone in the room needs to know what's going on. It's the basics that we've learned. Direct compression, yeah, initial control, make sure the patient's hemodynamically stable, get the blood on board. And then once everyone's on the same page, expose the injury. Don't just throw sutures. If you need to dissect around, then do that, especially if it's in a posterior location on a major vessel. Uh, direct suture repair at that point. If it looks like the injury is venous, you can use a clip. Obviously, you don't want to clip an artery, but if it's venous, you can use a clip, kind of slow down the bleeding, see what's going on, and then take care of it. Bowel injury is the third most common cause of morbidity and mortality uh, following minimally invasive surgery. Again, still fairly rare in the reported literature, but a huge problem. Most of them are unrecognized. I should say most of them, but 30 to 50% are unrecognized. But when that happens, that's a 30% mortality rate. Um, so, you know, it's quite evident from the preceding uh, uh, talks that we're all very, very cognizant of avoiding a bowel injury. And this is the reason why. If we find it at the time, not a big deal. We can fix it. Morbidity is pretty rare if we, if we recognize it at the time. If you do have a trocar injury, the main thing is don't take it out, leave it in place. Put another trocar in laterally to inspect how bad the injury is and where it is, and then you can repair as needed. Uh, intracorporeally, you can make an incision and pull out the bowel and repair extracorporeally, or if it's large laparotomy may be needed. Uh, do not wait on repair and do not wait on consulting general surgery. This needs to be repaired immediately, not after the case is done. If it's colonic injury, this can be a little bit more complicated and drainage is recommended. Um, but in the end, if one of these happens, even if I, I've learned, even if it's a small uh, injury, if, if you're through the cirrhosis, consult general surgery. Don't be a cowboy. Uh, get your help. Your friends are there for you. Solid organ injury uh, it can happen, although I, I, it's, it's, it's less common. Usually the liver, the spleen, sutures are not going to work here. So direct pressure, increase your pneumoperitoneum, get some hemostatic agents in there uh, and wait for a few minutes. And, and that usually takes care of it as long as it's not a through and through or major injury. If it's a major injury, then you need to consult your general surgeon colleagues. And then finally, port site hernia. Um, incisional hernias are, uh, you know, are, are they're less common than, well, port site hernias are, are, are less common than incisional hernias. So usually this happens at the extraction site, but at a two to 8% rate, uh, that's, you know, that's common. Um, single port surgery, I'm not talking about the single port robot, um, but single port surgery has been associated with a higher risk. Um, and other risk factors related to cars, the midline ports where, where we usually uh, extract from in any port that's over 10 millimeters. Uh, the European Hernia, Hernia Society in 2015 recommended to avoid a port site hernia to close off ports over 10 millimeters, especially in the midline. I only close the midline ports that are over 10 millimeters for full disclosure. They say use a non-absorbable suture, which I don't. I use an absorbable suture, and I'll tell you why. Uh, continuous closure, which I do with minimal travel and small fascia bites. Now, what I do is from the STITCH trial, which was released uh, in Lancet in 2016, and this was a practice-changing article for me, um, where they compare two OPDS with five millimeter, millimeter bites versus a larger PDS and one centimeter bites. A uh, very large study and a significant reduction in incisional hernia rates. Uh, and I've started to adopt this on my extraction ports. Um, I use uh, two PDS sutures from the corners, meet them in the middle in a running fashion, and I myself have seen very, very low rates of incisional hernia, so I've been happy with that. Um, so again, luckily, I have no videos of these things, um, uh, but unlucky for you, I hope that wasn't too boring, uh, but hopefully now we know what to do if we encounter any of these situations. And with that, I'll stop sharing and hand it back over to Dr. Joseph. Well, I simply want to thank my uh, panelists and uh, Dr. Go, Dr. Kowalski, and Dr. Zohan. Uh, tremendous experience. Uh, so thank you for sharing with us and we wish the audience a fantastic conference and uh, thank you.